They do what? What a humidifier! What is it that traps the particles or contaminants? Cilia. Let's start with with the air, with the hair or the whatever hair follicles that are in your nose. They trap particles, right? Yes. And then you said what? Cilia. The cilia. It's also another mechanism to trap the particles. And then you do what? Why? So they don't go where? Into the lower. Into the lower. I need some terms now. I explained that. To go where? They don't want them to go where? To the tracheobronchial tree. Right? Lower airway. Okay? And then you go from the oral cavity or nose to where? To the pharynx. Good. And then to where? To the larynx. Epiglottis. Is it closed or open on inspiration? Open. And on expiration? Closed. Why? So you want to aspirate. Why open and closed? So you want to aspirate. To prevent aspiration, what is aspiration? Choking. Choking. Into where? Into the tracheal bronchial. Preventing the particles to go down to your tracheal bronchial tree. Okay? Oh, no, they're not letting me out. <laughs> <coughs> after the larynx, where does it go? The air continues to go where after the larynx? Into the tracheal bronchial tree. Tracheal tracheal tree. tree. To the tracheal bronchial tree. And then Let's give me specific name from larynx to where? Next. To the trachea. 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 It's generation what? Zero. 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 And then what do you get? The main stem. Main stem. Left right and, and right. Left, right? Mm -hmm. Now the structure where it bifurcates or it splits, what is it called? Carina. 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 It splits at the carina. The right main stem comparing to the left main stem, how is it? Shorter, shorter, and what? Wider. 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 Now, this is a major site where when we're intubating, if we go deep, what happens? It goes to the right main stem, right? Okay. Then you've got yes. Um, the corona or corona. Corina, Thank yes. you. Um, in class, I thought you said it was three centimeters, and I think I read it was like four to six. Do you want us to stick three with yours? Three to five, four to okay. six. I will not probably test you on that. You need to know it's going to be about the right. I think in kids, probably it's about three. What, what we do in the hospital, three to five is fine. Okay. Whatever is in the book, if I happen to test you on that, it'll be whatever is from the book. Okay. Okay? Thanks. You're welcome. Then, from the main stem to where? The low block. The low block. To the lower. Now, you've got the right and the left. How many in the right? Three. 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 How many on the left? Two. 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 You've got two lobes on the left and three lobes on the right. And then you've got the segmental bronchi, right? Yes. And how many do you have on the left? Eight. 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 It's going to be a little on the two less. less on the left. And then on the right, how much Ten. do you have? Ten. 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 Good. And then you go to the sub. Seven. Segmental. That's okay. Keep talking to me. And then it keeps dividing and dividing. You go to the bronchioles and then th to the terminal bronchioles. And this is the end of where? Conduction. Conducting zone. That's it. I got there. Thank you very much. Your job is done now. It goes to where? Respiratory. Respiratory. Exchange. Where gas exchange occur on respiratory? Zone. Bronchioles. What other names? Talk to me. What other names would you see? might see on the test? Primary labial, functional unit, asinus, alveolus. Alveolus is only one al. It's one of the alveoli. But when we're talking about the respiratory zone, we're talking about the alveolar ducts, the sacs, the, the alveolus, it all together. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this is where gas exchange happened, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is everyone clear? So, is it 
No, if you go back to your notes, you said terminal bronchial, that's generation 16 to 19. However, you could say, I think there's a name for it, terminal, uh, where is it? Terminal bronchial? Respiratory unit, that's it. Yeah, terminal respiratory unit, don't get those two mixed up. You've got your terminal bronchioles, this is the end of your conducting zone. Your respiratory zone next. Yeah. is called respiratory, uh, terminal respiratory unit. Now, it's a unit. It's not bronchioles, respiratory bronchioles. Or it could be okay. respi respiratory bronchioles, go back. Now, don't get the terms. Respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, alveolar mm -hmm. sacs, these are the three components of the what? Respiratory, respiratory zone. zone. Right. Now the respiratory zone, if you flip to page 8, then guess what? You've got primary lobules for it, you've got acinus, terminal respiratory unit, lung parenchyma, and functional units. Those names are the same as the respiratory zone. Did I get you mixed up in here? Yeah, yeah. I'm confused now. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, so That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. So 20, generation 20 through 28 is a respiratory, respiratory zone. Yes. Right? Let's go back to that picture maybe. Okay. Can you see this picture? Let's turn the light off. Right. That's the picture. Yeah. Okay. Airway. What does histology mean? Tissue study. Tissue study. What is it made of? What is it composed of? Okay. So let's look at the cell. Go to page 30 in your book.
as I'm talking now, let me ask you something. Everybody printed, were able to print from Blackboard? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So do I need to give you time to write? No. No. I can do it all, but I can do it Okay, the whole point is I want you to listen. I don't want you to spend time doing this. Because if you listen, you'll retain it. And it's there. It's there for you to look it up. Can you log in to Blackboard? Can you see no, it? Yeah. That's not the problem for me, not only listening, but writing. As and well. this is the reason why I did this. But at the same time, I want you to listen as well. I don't want you to concentrate that's taking fine. notes only, okay? I'll do notes afterwards. Okay, perfect. Now. If you look at page 30, can everybody see where the epithelial cells are? Yes. 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 Do you see the cilia in there? Yes. 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 And what's the function of the cilia? Moving. To move. It beats move and then it moves particles, right? Yes. Okay. So the first thing I want you to know, in your conducting zone, there's some generation, not all, they have epithelial cells, and they're what? They have cilia in it, okay? And then, I need to see that picture. Above the epithelial cells, you've got what? Two layers. The sole layer that is adjacent to the cilia and the gel layer. Those are called mucus blankets. What are, they, what are they made of? Mucus. Mucus. Okay. What are they composed of? 95% they're composed of water. And you've got only 5% lipoprotein and carbohydrates and lipids and other stuff. But the main thing, there's 95% water. Okay? There's a reason why they're there. They're not there because they felt like they want to be there, okay? We'll get to it. However, locate for me the goblet cells. Can, can you all see the goblet cells? Yes. yes. Okay. Those goblet cells, they produce mucus. That's what their job is, mm -hmm. <coughs> okay? And then you've got the basal cells. Do you see where the basal cells are? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Basal cells, what they do basically, they serve to replace the ciliated cells and the mucus cells as needed. Okay? It's right in your notes and it's to replace the ciliated cells and the goblet cells or mucus cells as needed. Okay? Do you see where the submucosal gland is? Yes. Do you see where how it goes down to the lamina propria? Mm -hmm. Good. This is an important diagram to learn. There is a mechanism that happens in here. Let's go to the mucus blanket, the one at the top, very top. The, the gel layer, it's the very top layer, right? Mm -hmm. This is viscous. What it does, it traps all the particles in any contamination or foreign things that happen to go down to the tracheobronchial tree. It traps them. Underneath, there's what? The sole layer, right? Mm -hmm. This layer, what it does, it's kind of like liquidy, watery and the cilia is underneath of it. So what happens is the gel layer takes it and the cilia along that's, that's along the sole layer, it beats and beats and beats and beats and goes where? It moves them, right? Mm -hmm. Now, once it moves them, it, move the, it moves them to the larynx. Let's, now remember, we talked about the structure, right? It moves them to the larynx at what? At a rate of two centimeters per minute, okay? And then guess what happens? From the larynx to where? To the oropharynx. And then you either swallow them or you spit them. You cough, 
you spit them or you swallow them. Understood? That's how you get mucus out. Exactly. Now, there's certain things that damage those cilia in the mucus blanket that you find in your cells. What is it? Smoking. Absolutely. First cause. Dehydration. It, da it damages your cilia and guess what? You won't, your cilia won't be able to work anymore the way it should be. Dehydration. That's why when, sometimes when I'm working, if I'm not in ICU and I'm dealing with patients, they're trying to cough and cough and cough and they can't get things out. Drink water. Think, drink water. It helps. Trust me. They're, You're dehydrated. Not only that, they've been a smoker all their life. Their cilia is what? Guess what? You need you need to loosen this mu mucus up a little bit. Drink some water, preferably not cold water. Just room temperature. Go ahead. Yeah, that's your question. Okay. I just had a thought that I wanted to go for, but good. Ask me when you need to. Now, other things are in the tra in the tracheal <coughs> tube suctioning. When you're going down and you're sucking and you're getting all the mucus out, guess what? There is a risk for damage. If you give too much oxygen, if you give too little oxygen, if there's the body is starving from oxygen, another term is what? Hypoxia. Yeah. Okay? Atmospheric pollutants, if you it depends what 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 job you work. So if you work in dust area and, and you're a construction worker, more likely you will damage your cilia. Now, if you damage your cilia, the only way to get these particles out or those pollutants out of your lungs is by coughing. The cilia won't work anymore. You have to cough, and that's why you will see a lot of patients coughing, 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 and they're not able to get it out. Because the cilia is not working. Okay? Any questions? Yes? So the mucus is produced in that gland? Yes, and the goblet cells. In the, and the goblet cells. Okay, so both of them is where it's produced, and then it, it for lack of a better word, works its, its way up. Through yes, the, and the and way it works its way up by the cilia moving when it traps, it traps the particles and it moves them along, and guess what happens? It goes to where? The gel layer? No, the gel layer traps them. Okay. And the cilia underneath, which is underneath what? The sole layer. It moves them because it goes from the gel layer to the sole layer, and then it moves them, it moves them, and then go where? To the larynx. To the larynx. And then what do you do? <coughs> and then you cough. cough. Or yeah. go, it you goes to the aeropharynx, and then you either spit them or you... Some people swallow them. Whatever. We're not going to even go there. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Any other questions? No. All right. Then you go to the lamina propria. And I think I'm going to go to the diagram now. All that I've talked about, they're all in here. Now you have the lamina propria, which is right in here, right? Mm -hmm. Now remember when we talked about the airways, we said, some of them from generation what to generation what they have cartilage? Zero, zero, to, nine. Zero, to nine. Nine. zero to nine, they have cartilage. So this is the part where cartilage exists. It's the outermost layer. If you flip back to page 33, you'll actually have a good understanding how it's formed, how it is. Do you see it? Yes. Do you see how the cartilage is the outermost layer? Mm -hmm. yeah. And once we hit generation 10, this cartilage is gone. The lamina propria, it has fibrous tissue, it has tiny blood <coughs> vessels, lymphatic vessels, and branches of the vagus nerve. 
Mast cells are also found in lamina propria, playing an important role in the immuno immuno immunologic mechanism. Did Miss Miller talk about mast cells with you? No. She will. And she'll go into details because she loves to talk about mast cells and what happens with mast cells and asthma and all these things. She will talk about it, but I want you to understand that those mast cells play an important role in your Im immunity system. Okay? Now, do we have blood vessels in there? Yes. Where are they located? In the lamina propria. In the tracheobronchial tree, in the histology of it, right? Any questions? Okay, we'll move. What this is saying right here is whatever I explained to you about how the mucus is moved and it goes up to your larynx to the oral pharynx and how you actually get rid of it. All right? This diagram right here will be in your quiz. Do you see where the bronchial is? From the bronchial, yes. So if we didn't print the new one, uh, but, okay. we, but we went down and wrote notes on the original, uh -huh. then we don't get to use that diagram. That's why I said it's going to be in here, it's going to be, you're going to have open notes for that, right? Yeah, and I believe this diagram this is in your book too. Are we allowed to use the book? Yes, that's why I said you're allowed to use the book if I did not cover the material. Remember that now. We talked about this, no, right? No, that, that certainly helps. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. What page is that diagram? Are you looking for that right now? Yeah. Let me look for it. Hold on. What are you going to have? Terminal, Terminal bronchial. bronchial. This is in your book, right? In your notes. And then guess what? You move along, you've got blood vessels. You see where the blood vessels are? Mm -hmm. In red. And then you've got the alveolar ducts, which is one big one right here, alveolar ducts. <coughs> and then you come to the sets, which is one, one, one. But within those, there is the alveoli. Do you get that? Yeah. Is it clear? I will have this up when you're taking your quiz. Okay? It's not rocket science. It's whatever you learned. And, and let me tell you something. It's not word for word. You need to understand. You need to know when I talked about ter bronchial, I talked about them bronchioles, terminal bronchial. So if you know that this is your bronchial, you know you're going to get to where? To your terminal, terminal bronchial. bronchial. And obviously, those are vessels because you can see that those are vessels, right? Okay. Then you get to the bigger one, which is, look at that. Those are alveolar ducts. Okay? Within the ducts, you've got small sacs. Right? With those sacs, there's actually alveoli and alveolus in there. Okay, look at those. Those are alveoli within themselves. And then they're connected in here through capillaries. And they're called alveolar capillary membrane. There is capillaries that actually run in here so gas exchange can happen. Because if there is no capillary, there is no blood. 
and if there's no blood, oxygen can get to it. Okay? Any <coughs> question? So that, that's where the interstitial is. Yes, we will get we're gonna get there. Don't don't move fast. We'll get there. It just came to me and I got really excited. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you're right. You're right. But does it make sense? Bronchioles and then we go down to terminal bronchial and guess what? You've got vessels and you've got those ducts right here, and then within the ducts you've got sacs, and then you've got your alveoli, and they have what? Capillary along them, and guess what? <coughs> Gas exchange happens. Within the alveoli, here's an alveoli, here's another one, here's another one. There's actually channels of the communication between them. So air can pass from one alveolus to another alveolus, okay? And they're called pores of kind, okay? And it's all in your notes, but we'll get there. Now what I'm gonna talk about, this in here, and I'm gonna talk about the histology of it. Okay, what is it made of? If I take one alveolus, and for me, if I represent an alveolus, it's gonna look like this. This is one alveolus. And I'll be referring about one thing, but you have millions and millions and millions of them in here, okay? What is it made of? This alveolus, what is, what is it made of? It's made up of three types of cells. So now I'm where? Down to where? To where gas exchange occurs, right? Type one cell. It's called squamous pneumocyte and it makes up 95% of the alveolar surface. So most of the alveoli or alveolus that I'm talking about, it's made of what? Type what cell? Type one. one cell. Okay? 95% of the alveolus is made up of not if type one cells. <laughs> now you go further and it says type two cells right here. It's only 5%. However, it's very important because type 2 cells release something called surfactant. And surfactant is very, very important to your lungs. What does it do? It reduces surface tension. What do I mean by that? Here's your alveoli. Now, along the wall right here, you'll see surfactant, okay? And that's produced by what? Type two by type 2 cells. Two cells. Okay? What it does, here's the alveolus. The alveolus tend to what if it's not? If, Collapse. if there's no air, what is it going to do? Collapse. It's going to do this. You can't, no, 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 you can't do that because if we do that, we can't breathe. Then it's going to be very hard to reopen them and start inflating them. That is wrong. That's something, if, if it goes to the point where your alveolus is collapsed, the term is called atelectasis. And this is actually not good because then we need to work with the patient to have, open up their alveoli. Breathe faster and they're gonna be short of breath because in this collapsed alveoli, gas exchange will be hard to happen, okay? So your alveoli, when you breathe in and then you exhale out, there's a little bit of volume that actually stays in your lungs. It doesn't go down all the way, okay? It stays open a little bit. That volume that stays at the bottom and never gets out, it's called the residual volume. And we will talk about that. But I want you to be familiar with the terms when we talk about it. 
it's called residual volume that's the volume that actually stays in your alveolus when you exhale out okay yes so it, so it just helps to keep some form of a shape it, it keeps it open it okay. prevented it from collapsing that's okay. what it all does right. basically okay all right i'm just trying to think of something different okay if you want to relate it to something think about a balloon okay and you're trying to inflate that balloon and the fur the, the hardest is what when you actually with the first breath right what it, it takes a lot of energy from you to what to inflate it right once you get that first breath blown in guess what it's much easier for your lungs that first breath needs to stay there so it's a little bit open so it's easier for air to get into your lungs make sense yes yeah. good okay what helps your alveolus stay open like this or preventing it from collapse is surfactant. And surfactant is produced by type 2 cells. When I talk about surface tension, <coughs> what I mean, because they're so small, okay, they have the tendency to collapse. The, in surface, the, the higher the surface tension, guess what? The more collapse it's going to be. So when I say it helps prevent or or decrease the surface tension what I mean by that it helps the surface tension to get okay chill out a little bit you know we yeah. need to leave this alveolus open okay so you will see that term when I say surface tension surface tension is not good because it tends to make your alveolus collapse and what keeps it from collapsing is the surfactant that's produced by type 2 cells so it's like a chemical? Yes, it's like a jelly whatever thing. Okay? So you can think about it like a fluid. That's what I mentioned in my notes. Fluid. And then you have type 3 cells. Didn't we say that in the tracheobronchial tree, you might have some foreign particles that's going to go down, you know? Your cilia will do the job, but guess what? Some of the particles will actually go down to your alveolus, okay? And this is when damage starts occurring to your lungs. However, you have type 3 cells, and what they do? Macrophages. They eat. They go around, okay, you don't belong here, and they take it out, okay? That's all their job take foreign particles from there, okay? I talked about pores of con, and those are what? Communication channels between the alveoli. And if you go to page, let me see if I got it. Forty. No, no. alveolus from collapsing okay any question <coughs> no question okay here's a picture Pores of con can you see them right in here yes, yes. Okay, look at this picture for me. What is this? This thing that's right in here. It's an alveolus, one alveolus. And for to make things easier, that's why we refer to one, but that actually happens in every alveolus that's in your lungs, okay? 
in here, you see oxygen, right? Coming in. However, look at this. Oxygen gets in here, from here to here, right? And carbon dioxide from here to there. Which makes sense. We need to, oxygen, we need to get it to our body, to our tissues, and the carbon dioxide, we need to what? Get rid of it. Can we get rid of it? Through ventilation, right? Breathe in, breathe out. When we breathe out, we get rid of that carbon dioxide. Okay. In here, there's what? That line. Surfactant. Surfactant. It keeps your alveolus open. And then you've got capillaries that have what in it? Blood. Yeah, I hope blood, not water, okay? You've got blood in here. And blood is coming, carbon dioxide move out, and oxygen move in. And we will get there how they move, okay? But I want you to see something in here. In between, right here, in between. You see this? Mm -hmm. What is this? Interstitial fluid. Fluid space. This is a space that contains fluid between the capillary and the alveolus. It's the space that's located between every alveoli and capillary bed membrane. In every alveolus, there's a capillary bed membrane and there's the interstitial right there. It has two major components, tight space and loose space. What I want you to know that the tight space is the area where the epithel alveolar epithelium and endothelium of the pulmonary capillary. This is where gas exchange occurs. That's what I want you to know. Through the space, that's where gas exchange occurs. The tight space? Yes. And there is a picture in your book that I guess explains where the uh, tight space, space is. I know it's somewhere in here. No, not 35. 45. 45. Yeah. It's 45. Yes. So just to get a visual picture, okay? Do we understand? Okay. Now, how does gas exchange occur? You know what? We're going to go back to the picture. Because when you see the picture, things will make sense to you. Look at this one. Right here. This is all written in your handout. Okay? Listen to me. Now, we breathe in. And we did talk how the air moves from your nose or your mouth down to your lungs, right? Mm -hmm. Now we get to the smallest part, which is what? The alveolo alveolus, right? Mm -hmm. You go to the alveolus and then guess what? That air that you breathe in, it's rich in what? Oxygen. 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 Does it have a lot of carbon dioxide? No. 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 Very little. Very, very, very little. 0 0.003 or something. However, you got 21% of oxygen in here, right? Okay. Now, your, the air gets in here, and then you've got capillaries that are flowing, right? Yeah. Now, when the capillary from here, when blood flows through the capillary in here, this is coming from where? From the tissues. It's going to be rich in what? Carbon dioxide, which is waste, right? waste product. It's coming to what? To unload the carbon dioxide and then to what? Load some oxygen so it can take it back to the where? To the tissue, right? So it comes in here deoxygenated and rich in carbon dioxide. And by diffusion, and this is all passive because we have higher gradient of carbon dioxide in here in lower gradient of carbon dioxide in here, it's gonna go by diffusion. So oxygen is gonna diffuse from here, carbon dioxide, I'm sorry, it's gonna diffuse from here to there. Make sense? Yes. 
just by diffusion, it's all passive. Now, we said this is low in oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. Still by diffusion, oxygen is going to go from the alveolus to the capillaries. Now, what do we got in the capillaries at this point? More oxygen in very low carbon dioxide. It's going to go back to the tissues and it's going to do what? Give oxygen to the tissues and tell it, okay, bring me your waste back. It'll take the waste and we'll back, we're, we will be back in here at this point. Get it? Yep. Okay. That's all that's happening. This is how this whole th cycle happens. Okay, now. So what is the, you said the tight space is more than gas exchange. Yes. What's the loose space? It's in there. What is it there exactly? I don't know what's the function of it, but it's there. But I want you to understand that this is where the gas exchange happens, okay? Now, there are two types of respiration. Remember we said, let's go back to this. I love pictures. Let's go back to this. Remember we said from, from this point, it's coming from where? From the tissue, right? Tissue. Yeah. And in here, it's between the capillary and the lungs. This is capillary and tissue. If I tell you there's two types of respiration, there's internal and there's external. And I tell you the two types, one happened between the capillary and the alveolus, alveolus and one happens between the capillary and the tissue, what would you expect the external respiration to be? Where? You've got capillary and alveolus, and you've got tissue and, and capillary. Capillary and alveolus. Capillary and alveolus, because this is ex now you're going deep into the tissue. That's going to be internal. I don't want you forgetting this. Two types of respiration. Internal and external. External is, okay, we're coming in right now. It's going to be on the, in the lungs and the capillary. Then we're going to go all the way to where? To the tissue. And this is internal now. Make sense? Yes. Are you going to forget that? And both of them are, are diffusion, correct? Both of them happen by diffusion because the gas is going to go from low concentration to high concentration. Why are you puzzled? No, I'm just trying to remember that diagram because I know it's going to be a zinger when I'm taking this. It's, that's why I love to show pictures because when you see it, it makes sense to you than just me sitting here and talking about it. Can you just say that one more time with the internal, external? Sure. I want you to remember when the air comes in, it's rich in oxygen. Okay, because it's rich in oxygen, it's going to come, it's going to go, last space, it's going to go when the tracheobronchial tree is to where? Alveolus. Now it's, gas exchange is going to happen, okay? It's going to go to the capillary. And because of gradient differences, you've got low uh, oxygen in the capillaries, it's going to travel from the alveolus to the capillary by diffusion, okay? Did I lose anybody? No. This is called external respiration. Now from there, it's going to travel all the way from the capillary to where? To the tissues, because it needs to, f to feed the tissues. The tissues need oxygen okay. to survive, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Once it gets to the tissue, now the tissues are low in what? Oxygen. oxygen. So it's going to give off oxygen. This is going to be by diffusion as well. Concentration gradients from high concentration to low concentration. So it's gonna travel from the blood to the tissue, and this is called internal, internal respiration. Same thing happens when we're coming back. Now we're coming back and we're rich in what? Carbon dioxide. It's gonna go to the alveolus and by diffusion gradient. Okay, it's gonna travel from Low con concentration to high, con to from high concentration to low concentration, right? So it's going to go where the carbon dioxide, there's a lot to where there's, there's low, a little, a little bit of it, right? And it's going to go by diffusion to the alveolus, and you're going to exhale, and you're going to let it out. 
Make sense? Oh, I need a break. <laughs> okay. And this is all, it's all in here. It's all written in here, okay? You guys need a break back home? You know what? Five minutes break. Come on. Okay. Move around. See what I did over. Yeah, yeah. That was last that was your question. Oh, okay. That was where it was. No, no. You're persistent and you want to do something, it's not hard. And when I give you extra work, it's for you so you can prepare yourself. Okay? Let's keep going. You've got your wrong, and we talked about that, and we will talk about it again. Three lobes on the right side and two lobes on what? On, on the, the left. left side. Right? Let's talk about the this side right here. You've got right side, upper lobe, and middle lobe. Right? Mm -hmm. They're separated by what? Horizontal. 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 I hope this is not new stuff to you guys. Because mm -hmm. if you've taken A and B, this should be reviewed. They're separated by the horizontal fissure. And then you've got your middle lobe and lower lobe, and they're... Oh. Okay. Why are you doing this to me? And you've got the left lobe, it's got upper part, upper lobe, and lower lobe, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, did we finish talking about this? No. Let's go back to the right lobe. The middle lobe and the lower lobe, they're separated by what? Oblique, Oblique fissure. Now we move to the left side. The upper lobe and the lower lobe, because it's only got upper lobe and lower lobe, they're separated by what? Oblique fissure. Okay. Now, we're going to be talking about segments. Do you remember when we said you've got the right and main, right and left main stem, and then it go into what? Segmental, and then segmental, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the segments a little bit. We've got how many on the right? Ten. Ten. And how many on the left? Eight. 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 Good. Now, what I want you to know, probably learn the names of the segments. But what's most important is I want you to know that on the right side there's three lobes, right? Upper, middle, and lower. Now, in the right lobe, there's 10 segments. There's three segments that make up the right upper lobe. This is what it stands for, right upper lobe. Three segments that make up the right upper lobe. And they are apical, posterior, and anterior. You will have an exercise for you to color and probably label. And then you have two segments in the middle lobe. So three in the upper, two in the middle, and they are lateral and medial. And in the right lower lobe, you have five segments now. They are lateral, basal, lateral basal, anterior basal, medial basal, posterior basal, and superior. Clear? Now we're going to go to the left lung. And it has how many lobes? Eight. Two lobes. Two, Two lobes. lobes. And eight, eight segments. Segments. Yeah, eight segments. segments. Now, out of, 
I know it doesn't have a middle lobe. However, there's something, an area called lingular area. And this is, you see right here, lingular? Mm -hmm. This is supposed to be saying lingular as well. It's a typo. Oh. Do you see that at the back? Do you know what I'm talking about? Misspelled. Yeah, it is misspelled. It's lingular. Lingular area or region, this is similar to what? The middle lobe. But does it have a middle lobe? No, it doesn't, but they call it lingular region. It, it co co corresponds to the right, same as the right middle lobe. Okay? So, there's eight segments. Two segments that makes up the left upper lobe, and they are apical posterior and anterior. There is two in the lingular area, superior and inferior, and there's four, now we have all together four I talked about, right? Mm -hmm. Two in the upper, two in the lingular area, and then four sections in the left lower lobe, and they are four segments. They are superior, lateral basal, basal, anterior medial basal, and posterior basal. You will have an exercise to actually color those. I had to memorize each and every single one of them. I'm not gonna make you memorize this because I know when I went home I said, if you're in front of me, I would probably kill you right now. <laughs> you're not supposed to memorize it, but I want you to know how many segments there is in each lobe. And I want you to know that the lingular lobe, it's similar to what we see middle lobe, but there is no middle lobe in the left lobe. Okay? So you want us to memorize that there, that there are 10 segments in, in the right lobe and, and eight segments in, in the left lobe. And how many in each lobe? And how many sub-segments? Yes. Okay. And go to page, let me see in your book. Okay. 
this site has fluid in it. It's like a lubricant. It helps these two membranes not touch with each other and not rubs into each other. If they get inflamed, it's called pleurisy. And this is not a fun thing. When you walk into a patient room and you know that patient's got pleurisy and they're in so much pain, it is so much pain. They're not kidding. Okay? So the pleural fluid is the fluid that's between what and what? The visceral and the parietal. Okay, and it ha it's, it's there for lubrication. Do we all understand this? Are we all clear? Okay, put your pens down and look at this picture. You've got your lungs. If you take your lungs apart from your body and you set it right in here, what are they going to do? Collapse. Collapse. They have the tendency to what? Collapse. If you take your rib cage from your body and you let it just in the air, what is it going to do? Fall apart. Just like this. So your lungs are going to collapse and this is your rib cage is going to go like this, right? So they're opposite <laughs> of each other. Make sense? That's really important to understand now. Let's go down a little bit. Remember how we said there's the parietal and there's the visceral membrane, pleura, right? Yeah. Remember how we said there's one that's attached to the lung and one it's attached to what? Thoracic, Thoracic. right? Okay. Those two, the visceral and the parietal pleura are firmly, the visceral pleura is firmly attached to the lung. Okay, and the parietal pleura is attached to the thoracic and between and between there's the <coughs> fluid pleural fluid right mm -hmm. those together with the fluid it helps to kind of keep things together your lungs is attached to your thoracic cage through these two membranes does that make sense because mm -hmm. this is really important to understand for later Okay, now listen to what I'm going to say. When the, th when the thorax expands, and how is it going to expand? Inhalation when you breathe in, right? The parietal pleura is attached to the thoracic wall, right? Body wall. You might think that this would cause two pleural membranes to pull apart. They never pull apart. They stay together, okay? Because of the serous fluid, there's enough surface tension to act like a glue and hold the visceral and parietal pleura together. This way, as the parietal pleura is drawn out by the thoracic wall because it's expanding and it's attached to it, it's going to be drawn out, what is it going to move with it? Exactly, and your lungs expand. Does it make sense? Now, a lot of factors play a role in this, where you've got the pressure factors and everything. But for simplicity, I want you to know that this space does not get any bigger. As your thoracic cage expands, it takes everything together and it pulls it apart. It pulls it like toward it. Got it? Yes, no, no, yes. Did I lose anybody? <coughs> Clear? Yes? Yes. 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 Okay, thank you. Remember when I said pneumo, what does it mean? Air. 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 When you say pneumothorax, <coughs> have you ever heard of this term? Yes. What does it mean? Air trap where? Okay. 
Trauma can lead to introduction in air and trapping of air or blood. Pneumothorax is air. Hemothorax, hemoblood, is blood is trapped. What does it do? It compresses on the lungs. And guess what? Now you have a hard time breathing. Okay? Those terms, the only reason I'm introducing those terms to you because later on you will see them and then you'll go back. Yes, I'm familiar with them. Okay? Let's see if we can find pictures for this in the book. And if you do find a picture, let me know. Page 61. Okay. Thorax houses and protects the organs of the cardiopulmonary system. Same as saying grip cage. It protects. What is it made of? There's the sternum, and it's got three components, the sternum. What are they? Manubrium. Manubrium. Sternal body. body. And xiphoid process. Look at your book. Can you see them in your book? Yeah. yeah. Good. And this is, an, this is just anatomy that you should have taken them before, right? Okay. Now the ribs. You've got true ribs, false ribs, and floating ribs, right? True ribs are from one to seven. And know those, please. They are directly attached to what? The sternum. The sternum. And that's why they're called what? True ribs. True ribs. The false ribs are from eight to ten. And what are they attached to? The cartilage. Okay. They're attached to the costal cartilage of the sternum. They're not directly attached to the sternum. Because if they were, they would have been called what? True ribs. True ribs. Floating ribs are what? They only attach on vertebrae. Vertebrae. That's it. And they're from 11 and 12. <coughs> this is pure memorization. I don't care how you're going to memorize this. You're supposed to memorize it. Okay? And you're supposed to know it anyway. You look at the picture. Right here is your manubrium. Do you see it? Is, can you see that or should I enlarge it? Is that better? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you see the slide over there? No. What is this? Manubrium. Manubrium. And then you go down to what? Sternum. And then down to what? Xiphoid. Okay. And then you've got your ribs right here. And can you tell the true, the true ribs? They're attached directly to what? To the sternum. sternum. And then you've got two ribs that are floating, and they're attached to what? Speak up. Vertebrae. Cartilage. Thank you. And the, the false ribs. And then the false ribs is what? To the vertebrae. Good. Are we all clear? Did I lose anybody? I believe there will be a question in your exam about those ribs. Either the take home or the exam. I want you to know which ones are the floating ribs, which one are the false ribs, and which ones are the true ribs. And it won't be a question that would be which ones they are. No, it'll be within something that you need to know in order for you to answer that question. There is no right or false. It's just these exams are going to be analyzed. Okay? Now the fun part, diaphragm. Everybody, close your eyes. Take a deep breath in. What do you feel? What's happening? Expansion. How, how does your diaphragm move? Okay, I'm hearing lots of answers. When you inhale, Only one is correct. Down. Inspiration moves up. No, I'm saying take a deep breath in, and I didn't say expiration, I said inhalation. Take a deep breath in, what do you feel, what's happening to your diaphragm? Pulling down. It pulls down. Down. Take, take a, guess what? It's 
getting bigger and the diaphragm is moving down, right? Because I always thought when I started this program, it's going to move up. I don't know why. And then I'm like, you know what? Close your eyes and just inhale. What happens? It does move down, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, good. Because why? Because your rib cage is expanding. It's going to move. It's not going to get smaller. It's just going to get bigger, right? Makes sense. The diaphragm is the only muscle that control your ventilation. The only muscle, and this is really important, that control your ventilation during normal breathing. If you're having exacerbation and you're having increased work of breathing, then you will use other muscles. But for normal breathing, your diaphragm is the only muscle that you will be using. Okay? It's composed of two muscles. They're known as right and left hemidiaphragms. <coughs> so you've got the right and left hemidiaphragms. It's controlled by the phrenic nerve. This is important. It is controlled by the phrenic nerve, okay? Once the phrenic nerve is damaged, guess what? You won't be able to breathe. So the diaphragm is controlled by the phrenic nerve. It, it is controlled by the nerve that's called phrenic nerve. If the phrenic nerve is not functioning anymore, you won't be able to breathe. <coughs> okay? Yes. Does that phrenic nerve? I, I I know I've heard about it before. Did it originate in the brain? And it go. I believe so. Okay. And then it, yes, I believe so. What would cause it to stop working? Accident. Okay. Trauma. Okay. Questions? No, I was talking about not breaking. Exactly. Certain. Yes. And when I used to work at my children, I this this incident. I don't know why it got into me. I always work in the NICU, neonates, and I love it. You know what? They don't have a personality. They're like angels. Not that pediatric. They're not. They are angels. Okay. But but I have two kids my own. And when I see something, I I was training in there every day. I go home crying. And I no, I don't want to do that. There was one kid. I can't even remember his name now. He was playing with his cousin and his brother. And his brother put him on his neck, on his the shoulder. And he was going around the room and then his cousin came and pushed him. And he fell up right on his neck. And fortunately, that phrenic nerve, guess what? Dysfunction. And guess what? He was on the ventilator for the rest of his life. I believe six months after he was on the ventilator because he was coming back and forth, you know, to the unit. Every time I knew he was there, I had to go see him. I don't care. And, and, and he was five years old, and I don't think he comprehends what's going on, or he used to comprehend what was going on. And honestly, every time I saw him, I cried. And I had that stable <coughs> bench unit that, that day. And I heard the nurse telling him, was it Tishon, his name? I can't even remember. She goes, if you keep spitting, I'm going to put a mask on your mouth. So I walked in there, and, and I talked to him. I said, would you like me to come and spit at you? He goes, no. I said, why are you doing this? He's trying to get some attention here, okay? And he goes, I want to eat my fries. And he was straight, by the way. So he did. I, I gave him a fries. I gave him pop to eat it, to drink. And then we went for a ride together, played some games. And I said, uh, look at me. This is not a nice thing to do. If you want something, let the nurse know. Okay, because he can talk. Because of the, the puff that they've got, you'll get there later. He was able to speak, even if he, that he was straight. And I said, you can't just spit like this. I don't think he comprehends what's going on. He's sitting on the chair. He can't move. He can move his hands just a little bit. He can't breathe. It's the machine that's given him the breast, the ventilator. And he's looking all around. Okay, why can't I walk like the other kids? Why can't I do that? Another incident that I saw, two-year-old. Two. Car accident with her grandma. Guess what? 
she was tricked and paralyzed. And nothing got into me as much as this mother, where she would go, I think her name was Melanie. Yeah, because she go, Melanie, do you want to walk up and down the hallway? Wiggle your feet. I'm like, you, she cannot even wiggle her feet. Don't tell her to wiggle her feet because she cannot do it, period. She's paralyzed. She can't breathe, she can't walk. Don't tell her that because when you tell her that, you give her hope. And that's not right. Wiggle your feet and we'll go. If you start wiggling your she I think the mother was in shock that she, her daughter can't eat. Yeah. And you will see it. And that's why when you see kids playing like this, that's not right. You know, when I see my kids, hey, stop. And I always tell them, this is what I saw. Does it, you guys want to end up like this? Keep playing the way you're playing. Yeah. So once you lose function of this nerve, guess what? That's it, you can't breathe anymore. You're on the ventilator for the rest of your life. I have one more question about this nerve. Um, could it, I understand that it could be an accident or a trauma that could make it stop working. You would never, it would never be like an infection or something that would attack her, right? Maybe, I mean, anything is possible. So just if it basically bottom line is if it stops working, you're, you're if it's not done. functioning, okay. then you you lose the ability to breathe. Okay. Okay. Um, with newborns, just with babies when they're newborn, there's a defect in the diagram, and the diaphragm, and it's called diaphragmatic hernia. I don't know if you've all heard of it, but this could be corrected with surgery. Sometimes it could be severe and they could lose their life. But some most common, you know how we said we have right and left? Most common on the left side. And it's called diaphragmatic hernia. And just lots of complication. And when they're born, they go into surgery. Sometimes they're fine and everything is good. Other times they, they're just, their diaphragm won't work as the way that you would see the breathing pattern. The way they breathe, it's not right. Okay? Questions? Okay, so when stimulated to contact, to contract, and that is what? The diaphragm. It contracts, and then the diaphragm moves downward. The chest cavity enlarges, right? Once it enlarges, the thoracic volume increases, are you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Once it increases the intrapleural pressure and the intraalveolar pressure, the pressure that's in the pleural space and the pressure that's in the <coughs> alveoli, small alveolus, what does it do? It decreases. Now we have what? Pressure gradient, gradient. right? So air moves from the atmosphere and goes down to our lungs. You got it? Do I have to repeat that? No. Okay. So the air flows down to the alveoli since we have what? A greater pressure outside than the pressure inside our lungs. At the end of inspiration, the diaphragm relaxes and moves upward, making the thoracic cavity smaller. So what happens to the pressure now? It increases. And then by pressure gradient, the air moves out. out. Make sense? Yes. All right. Expiration during normal breathing is always passive. Okay? And the only m muscle that controls your breathing is what? The diaphragm. The diaphragm. If you have that W-O-B, it stands for increased work of breathing. Increased. Work of breathing. If you have an increased work of breathing, for example, an example of that, if those alveolus are collapsed, remember we talked about that, and it's called what? Atelectasis. <laughs> then what happens? You're gonna have harder time to breathe, and then guess what? You're going to need some help. Your diaphragm will not do it all. And you will see in here with patients when they're trying to breathe and those muscles are really like getting bigger now and extended. Okay? 
In other example, when you have increased work of breathing, if those alveolus that I talked about are filled with fluid instead of air. Mm. Now it's harder for the oxygen to move in and out, right? Then they'll have increased work of breathing. There's something called Herringbird reflex. They're also called infl inflation reflex. That's generated by, st by stretch receptors in the visceral pleura and in the wall of the bronchi and bronchioles. Those are receptors. What they do when they feel that the lung is overinflated, they tell it, stop, it's time to what now? Exhale. Exhale. Okay? Those are their functions. Neural control of the lungs. Miss Miller will come in Tuesday, and she will use the whole lecture to talk about sympathetic, parasympathetic, and all these things with you. I will be here. If you have questions, email me. Let me know, and I'll get back to you. This is the end of the lecture. Does anybody want me to put that picture up on the board? The quiz will be take home. You'll do it and bring it back to me. Anybody would like that picture on the board for a couple minutes? I'm not hearing a yes, I'm not hearing a no.